Hey kids, more overtime from Mrs. Donahue. Um, we left off in the last video by talking about fun celebrity baby names in the wake of some of the disturbing Puritan baby names. And we carry on our discussion of Puritans by looking at Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, how, how to talk to you about Jonathan Edwards. One, no, not the modern American uh, political person named Jonathan Edwards, though. It's an interesting Google. Learning about the two of them and how similar their names are is always very funny. Anyway, Jonathan Edwards is a Puritan preacher. So when you're looking at the types of writing you've gotten, um, nonfiction fiction, you're looking at nonfiction here. He really was a preacher. This really was a sermon he gave. Um, I have done you a favor about it, but I'll get to that in a minute. He was central to American Enlightenment. So he became one of the sort of moral center points of how America became sort of intellectual again. We had a lot of people come to America who were not intellectual. And after we sort of broke everyone's back building cities, um, we then had to fill them with people and then we decided those people should be smart. Um, and Jonathan Edwards is one of the ways that we get educated preachers and educated men into America. Um, an example of sort of early, well-educated American men. Um, he died shortly after becoming president of Princeton. I like that. He's a local boy. Um, they, they tried to give a vaccine, but they didn't do it right, so he died. Um, he's actually the grandfather of Aaron Burr. Why does that come up? Because Hamilton's coming up on this PowerPoint later. And also Aaron Burr, he is a really big Revolutionary War figure. He might not be very likable, but he's big. He's important. So Edwards is his grandfather. Some of his important written works were, and the, the titles are long, that was just a thing, but they were called things like God glorified it in the work of the redemption by the greatness of man's dependence upon him in the whole of it. Um, another one called A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton. Um, and Justice of God and the Damnation of Sinners. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God is one of Jonathan Edwards' sermons. Think of if you go to church, think of how the sort of typical formula goes. There's an intro by the preacher, thank you for coming. Then there's the sermon, which is the main idea of the lesson today, right? Like this is the thing we're talking about, this is the central idea. It gets the most time. It's the most important thing a preacher does. Sinners in the hangry, uh, Hands of an Angry God um, goes on for, I mean, hours, around three hours. If you have somebody reading it out unedited, you could be going for a long time, especially in the context of like a traditional church service, um, especially considering the fact that there's no microphones and stuff and you'd be screaming this. You would be screaming it, not just because you would want people to hear you, that plays into it, but also when you read it, you, you don't read something like this quietly. I've seen some pretty decent um, performances of it and everybody is always hoarse by the end of it. With this, I would like you to open up the document of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God on Google Classroom. When you are looking at that document, um, I want you to read through the different parts of it. I have cut it down. This is well over, the original document I had, formatting and everything, was over 20 pages. Um, this is very, very short. You don't need a lot of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God to understand Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, this was 1741. So we're significantly before the American Revolution. Um, but I would like to read it out to you now. I will preface this by saying I am not going to scream it, mostly because the only reason I'm able to make these videos is that the two children and the puppy are all sleeping upstairs. And if I start screaming, at least one's waking up. <clears throat> However, I'm also good and dry, so this is going to make me nice and hoarse anyway. On the top of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, I have for you the picture of God holding we the sinner in his hand over the fires of hell. The central image that uh, Edwards uses is basically like the only thing saving you from 
falling into the pit of hell is God because he's holding you and you're heavy and you're ungrateful and he's this close to dropping you at any given second. That's how small and insignificant and worthless you are. So imagine that this is your Sunday pick-me-up, if you will. Your wickedness makes you, as it were, heavy as lead and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf. And your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence and best contrivance and all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Pause. So, I love this image, but also it's really important the central message of Puritanism. No matter how good you are, and you're supposed to be perfect, nothing besides God himself keeps you out of hell. No matter how good you are, no matter how worthy you are, God alone keeps you out. And remember, he's not sharing his plan. He already chose who's going to heaven, and he's not telling you. This would depress me, but Puritans aren't allowed to say, like, this is a very depressing concept, that we could live perfectly our whole lives and just doesn't matter. Their whole thing is constant striving, endless toil, hoping that it is rewarded, also knowing that the idea of a reward is already been decided on. They're just hoping it's in their favor. We don't understand that level of grueling, self-sacrificing with uncertain reward. We just don't understand it. He continues to go on and reference God, particularly that we are a burden to God, that God's creation groans with us on it. Not in a good way, in a way of like, I hate these people. Uh, The creature is made subject to the bondage of our corruption, not willingly. So the earth has been made to... Um, be burdened with us without being asked. Like God forced the earth to deal with us. The shun does not, does not willingly shine upon you to give light to serve sin and Satan. The earth does not willingly lead up her increase to satisfy your lusts. All of the good things that God has given us should not go towards our bad behavior. So modern God um, typically um, is the God of forgiveness and the God of love. You guys are very used to kind of learning of New Testament God. So, you know, you have Old Testament and New Testament. Um, And of the New Testament, you have several different books and representations of God and Jesus. Typically, the warmer, fuzzier ones are the basis of more modern religions. This is a generalization, and I'm not trying to sort of uh, explain all religions with that, but I'm just saying in a general way. This is Old Testament God. This is the kind of God that like kills the firstborn sons of, of Egypt. This is the kind of God that sends plagues. This is the kind of God that wipes out all of civilization with a flood. This is angry God. That's not the God I really want to deal with. Though 2020 does make you question, doesn't it? 2020 makes you feel like Old Testament God is coming back out for a couple of innings. But... This is a God who does not love nor forgive us. This is a God who is weary of us. He is done with it. We are his naughty children that he regrets having. Um, This is a God who would not necessarily care that we burned. He stops it. He stops it. But he's real close to letting you go. Again, the thing I want you to look at is the massive amount of anxiety over how you're living your life that this would cause. We, in the modern people, the time of mindfulness, we're like, that is dangerous. That's a dangerous level of constant anxiety, constant worry, constant dread. It's bad for you. But this is how the Puritans lived all the time. In many ways, it is no small wonder that bad things happened. So the next thing, the crucible. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm really trying to figure out how to share the crucible in its whole text with you. 
The Crucible is based off the Salem Witch Trials. The Salem Witch Trials are real. The Crucible is a fictionalized event closely based on them. I say closely because like the names and stuff and often many of the events are accurate. There's a few inconsistencies. Like the main romance plot of, of Crucible is made up, but most of it is accurate. Um, it Weirdly, the hybrid schedule may suffer Crucible to be lost because I don't know how I would share it with you given that it is not on one of the shareable platforms. But I can tell you all about Salem Witch Trials. So the Salem Witch Trials. We said that coming to America for religious freedom, um, freedom from the persecution of England, freedom to kind of be as extreme as you wanted to be, it was a motivating factor for Puritans. In England, there was a sense that we had to root out witchcraft, but it simply wasn't as extreme as the sense that developed in America, probably from the nature of the religions, right? There's certainly conservative religion in England, and there's conservative religion here, but we're more extreme, so therefore our like witch hunting became more extreme. Religious freedom and religious persecution always compete to produce a sense of like, I'm right and you're wrong. My way is the right way. It's going to be my way or no way. My way or the highway is how Miss and Happy and I tend to describe it. It's, it's a mindset the Puritans very much have. They believe they have the only correct way to worship. You will do it their way or you will burn in hell. That's it. Um, people with competing religions living in close proximity butt heads anyway, right? They don't see eye to eye necessarily. So if you ever start talking about it, you're going to disagree. But you can get along. You can disagree with people and get along. But Puritans, imagine how hard it would be to live with Puritans. The the kind of perfectionism they expect from themselves and they expect from you. It's definitely going to cause tension. Um, you needed the hard work of the Puritans or America never gets built. You need people who are that willing to be that deeply unhappy and that deeply invested in their work or America literally doesn't fall, like ever function. It never gets built. There are no cities in America without Puritans. It's also crazy. And we cannot really tell how deep the scarring of that early extremism went. We can't tell if it's necessarily still here, though Miss Nappy and I show you some fairly provoking images that suggest, yeah, some of this ideology is still here. The reason we don't still have modern Puritanism is because of Salem. The Salem witch trials effectively kill Puritanism. It dies out within, I think, 50 years of the, of the Salem trials, which is, considering how old Puritanism was, pretty good. We killed it in 50 years. Um, why? Salem was this epic screw up. I mean, it, it, it showed the delicate, sad, sick underbelly of Puritanism. So witch trials were nothing new. They'd been going on in Europe since the medieval era. Like I said, there are several books and manuals dedicated to finding witches, um, the Maleficent Malfacarm, among other things. We allowed witch hunting to function a little differently in America. Particularly, Salem becomes one of the early sites of the witchcraft, of uh, the witch hunts. Um, it's not the first site, but it is the biggest. It's the most um, publicized, and it's the one that sparks this great big fire of witch hunts in America. And so Salem setting the rules sort of created a problem. You could accuse people of witchcraft in several different ways. I said that there were physical markers of witchcraft. Um, so those of you who are left-handed, sorry, witch. Sorry, those of you with moles, witch. Especially funny looking ones. Um, I have one, uh, three in my arm that make a triangle, probably a witch. <laughs> if you have freckles or moles in your hair, witch. One of the ways we checked you for witchcraft was we shaved every hair off of your entire body looking for hidden marks. Yeah, you'd find them. If I shaved my head, I'd probably find freckles I didn't know I had. Um, any sort of strange growths, really, were suspect. If you had um, close animal friends, uh, you know, just assume that they can be called familiars at any point. The number one reason that you would get accused of witchcraft, now this is for men and women, though, 
women exponentially more so than men. The, the amount of people that are accused of being witches typically, overwhelmingly, are women. There are men, though. And there are kids. We'll get into them. You would be accused of malfeasance. Malfeasance, also a gun in the video game Destiny. Fun fact. But malfeasance means bad behavior. Isn't that a nice general category? So this could be things like arguing with your husband was malfeasance. Um, being slothly or bad at your chores, malfeasance. Um, say you usually are the one who's in charge of churning the butter um, from the cream, but you overturn it and you ruin the butter. Malfeasance. Say your goats are always getting into the neighbor's patch and eating the neighbor's vegetable garden. Malfeasance. Say your children are ill-behaved in church. Malfeasance. So malfeasance could be many, many things, often things that we don't think of as particularly harmful. It wasn't as simple as, my kids are bad in church, therefore I am a witch. But the accusation of malfeasance could lead to an investigation, and that investigation could lead to looking for other evidence. Um, sometimes women were accused of malfeasance, and they were just let on their merry way. Sometimes they were warned. Um, and sometimes they then were found guilty of witchcraft. In Salem, a lot of factors started playing into how women were accused of witches and men. There were some notable male victims. Um, the first thing that became a problem in Salem was that spectral evidence early on became allowed and it had not been allowed in England and it was not allowed in other places, but Salem allowed it. What's spectral evidence? To answer that, we have to look at some of the conditions that created Salem, like how the, the accusations of witchcraft began. But let me look at other things that were sort of contributing factors to Salem being really bad, generally speaking. Um, the way we tested witches in general lends itself to finding witches. So you have your first problem here. One of the ways you can test a witch is it was called drowning a witch or um, flying a witch. So you would tie a weight to someone's feet and throw them in water. And if they drowned, they were not a witch. And if they rose to the top because they were a witch, then we took them out of the water and hung them. Same thing with flying. You would attach a weight to someone and push them off a cliff. And if they floated, then they are clearly a witch and we have to take them and hang them. But if they fall to their death, they're human and they were not a witch. My bad. Like, it, the way we found and tested witches usually found guilt. So it wasn't something that usually, you know, lent itself to innocence. The expert, we had an expert witch finder, because of course we did. He had the book several of them actually, several books on finding witches had Reverend John Hale. And Reverend John Hale made an early mistake in believing the town girls who were crying witch on other people. And because he, he said these girls should be listened to, other people listened to them. He should have ignored them. Um, the social hierarchy that existed in the towns actually made it possible for Salem to get as out of hand as it did. So I told you that at the very high, highest ranking position in Salem were male religious leaders. So you have Reverend John Hale, the expert witch finder. He, even though he's a stranger in town, walks into being one of the most important people in town. And at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, you have unmarried pre-adolescent and adolescent girls. In Salem, there was a big group of those girls they are the ones who begin accusing people of witchcraft. The reason that the highest level of men in the town believed the lowest level of girl was because they believed girls were simply too stupid and too obedient. Like they were told not to do this and surely they listen and they don't lie. So obviously if they said that the devil walked in Salem, the devil walked in Salem. Girls are too stupid to lie. <laughs> 
the girls realized quickly that because they were underestimated, um, that they could take advantage of it. Um, the girls also sort of intelligently understood the, the makeup of the town. They didn't start by going after the highest ranking members of town. They started by going after the lowest. They started by saying that really undesirable people in town were witches. And therefore it made it easy to be like, I don't really think these girls are lying. I mean, I don't like that person either. And because I want to agree with the girls, I'm going to. And once you believe them once, you have to believe them every time. It was a really short time frame. So even though Salem was terrible, it was only terrible for a couple of months and we killed a lot of people. Um, some men clearly also understood that the girls were lying and weaponized them. They understood that the girls were weaponizing themselves and they got in on it. So there were clearly men, fairly high ranking men in the society who looked at the girls and said, help a brother out and used them to execute rivals. Um, the fallout of Salem was that the, the hypocrisy of Puritanism was exposed and therefore Puritanism unraveled. Um, it's also more or less the, the reason that we have the novel The Scarlet Letter, so that's pretty cool. Um, when looking at Salem, so the next slide is one of the church sequences, um, I want to tell you how Salem happened, sort of give you the Cliff Notes version um, of Salem and of the Crucible. So I said the lowest ranked members of a society, especially of this society, were the girls. Now this doesn't stop them from being human, but they live in a society where dancing, playtime of any sort is not allowed. It doesn't stop kids from being kids. Just because we don't have an outlet for their energy doesn't mean they don't have it. So you have a group of girls between the ages of like eight and 18. They all get together and go into the woods. Why? Privacy. Right? There's not much of it to be had in a small town where everybody's in everybody's business. So they go to the woods. Um, one of these girls is the daughter and one is the niece of the town reverend. So the town reverend's the highest ranked member of the town. And he was a kind of controversial choice. The Puritans loved him, but a lot of the non-Puritans didn't like him. Um, they also had a slave. So he had a slave from Barbados named Tichiba. Tichiba's obviously put in charge of taking care of the children. So the kids are in the woods. Tichiba's probably half watching, half not watching because the girls do have the ability, even though they're children, to sort of give some order to Tichiba. Now, it, it, what we have from records suggests that Tichiba, in taking care of the girls, played with them. She's not Puritan. She might be Christian, but she's not Puritan. So she plays with them. She tells them stories. They need this but also it's terribly against their society. Also, girls gossip, probably boys too, I don't know. But the little girls start telling their friends some of the stories that Tichiba tells them, some of the games that Tichiba teaches them. So one of the things that occurs is these girls all start kind of congregating in the woods, doing things they shouldn't be doing, dancing, playing games. Now, um, the example I always give is um, and I don't know how many of you, boy or girl, would make sense of this example, but when you were younger and you had a sleepover with your friends, inevitably you guys start doing silly little magic games. I don't know. They're popular to a certain age. Like the same time you start reading books like, you know, Twilight is the same age that you start going like, we should really get a Ouija board out and see if we can like talk to grandma or we should really get out like egg yolks and needles and see if we can suspend the one and the other and it'll spell the first initial of the boy we're going to marry. Does any of this stuff work? No, of course not. But like you start kind of looking for your own power and whether or not it actually goes into the universe and the universe can talk back to you. It's a growing up thing. It's an adolescence thing. It's perfectly normal but they don't obviously understand that. The fact that the girls go into the woods and essentially do harmless little magical charms where they ask questions like, who will I marry? It's very dangerous to Puritans. Normal to us, silly to us, but like dangerous to Puritans. 
This goes on for a little while and they weren't caught. Then one day they're caught and they're caught by the reverend. So his daughter in particular, she doesn't just like flee the scene, she plays dead. She falls over in front of him and is stricken sick, does not move, does not speak, barely breathes. They started panicking after the first day because they said she cannot wake. Something is stopping her from waking. She cannot wake. Now, anyone in this time period, child and infant mortality is fairly high. So if your kids survive their infancy, good. But there, there was no guarantee they'd survive their childhood. Parents had no guarantee that their children would live to see adulthood. And this disproportionately affected, obviously, women who were the central caretakers of the children but also there was no predicting who it would hit. So like, for example, there was a family in Salem where the mother lost nine children and had one surviving child. You cannot fathom what that does to someone. Like emotionally, mentally, we cannot fathom what that does, Um, especially because you would look for answers. And then you're trying to look for explanations for justifications and you look around and another family has 17 children and never lost one. How do you justify that you lost nine and they don't ever lose one? No child or grandchild of that family ever falls sick and dies, but nine of mine do. That would really mess you up. So anyway, when the reverend's daughter cannot wake, the parents start really panicking and they're like, why can't she wake? What's going on? What's happening? They're obviously very, very worried. They're worried she's going to die. They're worried beyond her dying that something dangerous and sinister is happening. And essentially, the niece and the daughter say, um, when the uncle says, what were you doing in the woods that caused this? He blows it out of proportion a little bit, and then they realize that is the answer. You understand this behavior. Like, in my most frustrated moments, like, My daughter will sometimes throw a tantrum, as four-year-olds do. They throw them. They are not the most, you know, emotionally deep creatures. And sometimes they hit a wall and they have a tantrum. And I will look at her and I'll go, are you just tired? And then she'll look at me and go, yes, I am tired. Is she tired? No, she's a liar. But she heard me give her the answer, right? I said the answer that, like, I suppose I will accept, right? Are you tired? Yes, I am tired. If that's going to be the reason you don't yell at me for having a tantrum right now, yes. Yes, I am tired. The girls pull this on the reverend. He goes like, were you doing magic in the woods? And they're like, "Mm mm-hmm, yes, yes, we were. But we didn't invent it, Tichiba did. We weren't doing magic, Tichiba was. Didn't know if I heard a baby. Um, so Tichiba gets accused of being a witch. Now Tichiba is a slave. She is black. She is the lowest member of society. They instantly converge on Tichiba and they're like, hang on. So the girls blame Tichiba. Tichiba is actually quite intelligent. So when Tichiba starts being beaten to the point where she's kind of worried she's going to be killed by the men in town and they say do you serve the devil she doesn't say no because that's not the answer they want to hear she goes oh yeah i serve the devil and by the way so do three of you and the men in town were like oh my god there are three more witches in town she goes three that i could see there could be more who knows? This is the smartest woman of all time. Tichiba's amazing. Puppy needs to go take a pee break, so be right back. Now, the girls, um, Abigail was the niece and Betty was the daughter. Abigail and Betty are now angry because they thought that they were dodging getting in trouble by blaming Tichiba and crying witch on Tichiba and saying Tichiba was a witch. And then when Tichiba figures out that she can be like, yes, totally a witch, do not kill me, I will point out the others to you. Um, The girls realize that this was the ticket all along. 
So then the girls kind of look at each other, and then when their fathers and stuff go, did you know about these other witches? They go, oh, yeah. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and um, Goody Good, Goody Osborne, and there was one other one. Now, the three women they name, one was the town drunk, so the Puritans don't like drinking anyway. Town drunk, get rid of her. One was a homeless woman. She, I feel the worst for Sarah Good. Sarah Good was homeless. She didn't have a, a husband, he had died. And she had a three or five year old daughter named Dorcas, Dorcas Good. And uh, Dorcas Good later becomes the youngest victim of Salem. The reason she becomes a victim of Salem is that in these early trials, um, her mother was found guilty of being a witch because her mother was homeless and unwanted and had no one to protect her, and obviously she's a witch. But then Dorcas was homeless and had no mother, and nobody wanted to take her in. So little Dorcas Good um, admitted to being a witch so that she could go to prison, so that she could be with her mom, and she was hung. Um, I said, if she was five, that was as old as she was. Um, Dorcas Good was young. She just wanted her mother. And then the other woman that they cried witch against, so they have the town drunk, homeless woman, you have a town widow. Now she's a widow. She's actually pretty powerful as women go. You wanted to be a widow. Your husband died. You therefore inherited property. You were not required to marry again, because if you did marry again, your property would pass to your husband's heir, so your, your son, assuming you had one. The property would not necessarily be touched by the next husband, but he would own you, therefore he'd be able to control your ability to control the property. So it's not that it becomes his, but he controls you and therefore controls the property. It was heavily suggested that women remarry, especially if they were young enough to have kids. It was heavily suggested that they get, that they remarry. However, you couldn't force them. But we had Bridget Bishop. Bridget Bishop was a widow, twice I believe, um, who was extremely beautiful. And the reason we believe Bridget Bishop gets cried witch against has a lot to do with how good looking she is. I told you that, you know, all bad thoughts were foreboding in the Puritan, you know, way of understanding things. You can't behave wrong, you can't have wrong thoughts. Bridget Bishop was known um, in the under, the many underclothes that you would be wearing. It was known that Bridget Bishop had a sort of red undergarment. It was known by women, by the way, because women would have been sewing it, women would have been mending it when it ripped. Women would have been helping her in and out of her clothes. But as women start turning on each other in the witch trials, a woman cries witch on Bridget Bishop, and then all the men are suddenly like, yeah, I saw Bridget Bishop. Um, they would say, fly into my room at night. Um, and I, I know because of the red petticoat So Bridget Bishop gets hung as a witch. Obviously, we can't have these unmarried widows hussying around with our men. If you guys hear, that's the puppy. Um, good girl. So as the girls, the young girls, realize that they can cry witch on people and they get attention, they are listened to, this is about as powerful as they've ever been in their whole life, um, they start upping the ante and upping the ante. They start going after different people and they start closing ranks among the girls. So there's a group of about a dozen of them um, between 8 and 18 and it becomes a mean girl clique that has deadly power. The only thing that eventually stops them is that they go after ministers' wives, and the ministers eventually go, I think you're mistaken. Now, I said something about spectral evidence. Spectral evidence bears explaining. So the girls were allowed to claim harm from witches without any physical proof from the witch. So for example, I am Abigail Paris. Um, I am telling you that Bridget Bishop has um, harmed me. And Bridget Bishop goes, I was home in bed. And Abigail goes, not you, your spirit. Your spirit has harmed me. Your spirit left your body, flew through my window, and pinched me all night. And then Abigail lifts her shirt, scandal, 
um, and shows the pinch marks. She pinched herself, clearly. But she lifts her shirt and says, no, 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 your spirit pinched me. Your spirit bit me. Your spirit scratched me. Um, I was up all night hearing somebody say these things in my ear. I know it was you. I know your voice. So these were the types of behaviors that were permitted in Salem, not permitted many other places. Spectral evidence was seen as a shaky form of evidence. I wonder why. Now, also, the girls would do things in the evidence chamber. So this is how court looked. You had judges sitting up on a big table. And you had um, men and women in the audience. And then you just had the, the accused directly talking to the judge. There was no lawyer talking on their behalf. Um, I'm going to have to pause this for the night. More tomorrow.